All right. Welcome, everyone. It's so good to see your faces. We love to see it, especially if you are able to have your video on. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure for us to get some human contact these days and see your smiling faces. Welcome to the Pragmatic Institute webinar today. Um, a reminder as we go through today, if you have questions, go ahead and stick those in the chat and I'll be monitoring those. My name is Eddie Gordon. I'm the co-host of today's event. Uh, a couple quick housekeeping items at the top of the meeting today. We are very pleased to announce uh, the opening of the Pragmatic Alumni Community. This is the new online community for Pragmatic Institute. Members of the PAC, as we call it, will be able to find everything in there from a curated library of materials to peer discussion groups and member exclusive events. So the whole point of that is so that you can spend less time searching for answers to product-based questions and more time implementing those solutions. Join us for the second community open house where everybody will have a chance to jump in and see how it works. That happens June 10th at 1.30 Eastern time. You can find out more at the address at the bottom of that slide there, pragmaticinstitute.com slash community. Check that out. It is an amazing new resource. Today's discussion is brought to you in partnership with Product Development Days as part of their executive series of webinars. They will culminate in their grand event that takes place on the 27th through the 29th of October. Find out more information about that on their Facebook page for Product Development Days. Definitely check that out. Well, our guest today is founder and president of the Sharer Leadership Center. He's known around the world for his ability to connect with leaders as well as frontline staff in bringing about workplace-wide transformations. He's a prodigious writer of hundreds of works, including the books, uh, Work and the Human Spirit and Five Questions That Change Everything. He's also the creator of the Adventus Initiative, which we're gonna hear lots more about today. Its aim is to equip leaders to embrace uncertainty. We'll be talking about that as well as lots more wonderful topics. I've had the chance to chat with him here in the beginning, and it's been a pleasure so far. I'm sure it will continue to be. Please welcome Dr. John J. Scherer to the event. Hello, John. Great. You know, it's such a it's such a weird thing. I was watching Snooker the other day on TV. Every now and then I watch Snooker. It was the strangest thing. That, you know, the guy makes a fabulous shot and there's no applause. You know, there's just absolutely no sound at all. So it's a, this is a, a this is a coming to be a more familiar experience for me. But hello, everybody. Uh, nice to be in your in your presence, if not physically, at least electronically. So let's get started. Um, I, I call this uh, COVID-19 a cosmic opportunity, like how to operationalize the best of what you're discovering in the lockdown. So when this is over, I, I, I want you to have specific, practical, real world things, processes that you can take back and use both at home and at work. Okay, let's get started. So it's a strange world. I don't need to go through this. We've all seen this before. This is Madrid. I'm, I'm living, I'm coming to you from Warsaw, Poland in Eastern Europe. Uh, the streets are beginning to have cars again. The only busy places for a long time during this situation were these places. And you know, you maybe even know people who were affected some maybe, uh, maybe gravely, and you know what's happening. All because of this little fellow right here, just unbelievable. Something we can't even see has changed the world. It has changed the world. Uh, maybe like nothing ever has before. What an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. So is it a crisis? Perhaps you know this, that the Chinese character uh, for, for, for the word crisis actually contains two characters. The first character is, is the character for danger or threat. The second character is about a moment of choice. So it's not an opportunity. A lot of times it's been, it's been mistranslated, danger and opportunity, not necessarily so. It, whether it turns out to be an opportunity or not depends on what we do in response to the danger. The danger is a given, what we do next is not. And I love this quote from T.S. Eliot. 
for years and years I've loved this quote. And everyone gets the experience. Some get the lesson. We're all getting, we, we don't get to vote on whether or not we're getting this experience. This experience is happening, full stop. We don't get to vote on it at all. Some are getting a lesson. Who's getting a lesson? And what are the lessons that we're getting? And I hope before this hour is over that I'll help you think about what are the lessons that you're getting? What about you and your personal life, your family, your relationships? What about your team? What about your organization? Are there any lessons being learned? Let's see what happens. I think there's, the, there's this narrative that's running and there's chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three of this narrative. Chapter one is the virus hits everyone and every system is affected. There, you know, look at this. This at the family level, everyone is affected. Every organization is affected. There's not a single institution that I know of that isn't affected right now. If you think about education, healthcare, government, you know, military, the arts, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing. I mean, tell me, tell me some uh, institution or area that hasn't been affected. I can't think of one. So we're all affected, that's chapter one. Chapter two is the curve flattens at some point. Now, I don't know if there are gonna be multiple curves. You know, the, all the returns aren't in yet. We may have to find out the hard way, whether there's, you know, what the shape of this curve is gonna be. But let's say that the curve flattens so that the risk of infection starts to decrease. Here in Eastern Europe, people are starting to you know, venture out now into restaurants, gradual opening and so forth. Fingers crossed um, that, that um, when, it, when people rush out that it doesn't start another curve. What happens when the curve is flattened? People say, ah, hey, this is great. Let's hit reset and go back to the way things were. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not really sure there's gonna be a reset. I, I think that is a, a hope and a dream um, that, I, well, as you'll see in a minute, I hope we don't hit reset. Who wants to go back? That, I mean, that wasn't really working all that well anyway, was it? So maybe we do have an opportunity here. So that's chapter two, the curve flattens, let's hit reset, hmm, maybe not. Chapter three, leadership responds. Remember, leadership is an attitude, not a position. Leadership is something that happens between people. So you can be, you can exercise leadership when you're the, you're at the bottom rung of a, of a ladder in an organization. So, but wherever you are and, and wherever your circle of influence is, you are exerting leadership by how you respond to what's happening right now. So how does leadership respond? Well, it's leadership is thinking about the future. Management quite often is trying to figure out how do we do something better today? How do we, how do we become more, how do we get stuff out the door better, cheaper, faster? Leadership is about where are we headed? You know, how, where, where is this whole train going? Which is future oriented. Leaders meet sometimes in, in the same room. This is a, a, a leadership team in, in uh, Singapore. And more often than not, this is a leadership team that's meeting this way. Uh, my colleagues and I, we're in uh, 12 countries now. Uh, we have meetings, they're all on Zoom. And uh, frankly, I think there's going to be a flip happening here, whereas up until this virus, 90% of, of all the work that we did was face to face, maybe 10, 15% was online. It would not surprise me to see that ratio flip, where there's a, a huge percentage of, of, of what we do now. Uh, I mean, I think about this. Why, why should I get all dressed, put on my corporate costume, get in an Uber, go downtown Warsaw, to meet somebody else who got up and put on his or her costume to have a meeting with me. We sit and we talk for an hour and a half. I get in an Uber, come back to my apartment, take off my costume. Why not just do this? This is so great. So I'm, I'm, uh, I think we're gonna see a major shift happening. I'm interested in what is your leadership doing? How is your leadership responding? If you could put your thoughts over in the uh, in the chat box over there, um, Eddie, our, our host, uh, we can pause right now and I'd, I'd like to just kind of look and see um, any responses you have. What is leadership in your organization or in your family, in your community? How is leadership responding to this thing? I'm interested in that and, uh, and how you 
how you feel about that. What do you think? Eddie, right, do we have to, anything about that? I did get one sent to me personally. So just a reminder to our audience, if you have questions as John is speaking, you can send those in the chat either to everyone in the group or you can send them to just myself and I'll keep an eye on those and, and toss them over to John as time permits. I did have one that came up here as you were speaking about leadership being uh, something that happens between people, which was interesting. The question was, uh, do you have any advice on leading up when positional leaders have different approaches, my leader doesn't seem to think things will change that much because of current events. Great question. Yeah, how do you how do you exert influence up? Um, even in even in relatively flat organizations, I, I don't know how your organization is is put together. I spent four years as a combat officer in the U.S. Navy back during a little Vietnam thing, and that's definitely a, a that's a command and control organization. Uh, so a lot depends, my response depends on your, what your culture is, what your leadership culture is. So what I have to say may or may not fit, but you have sources of influence and power that you may not realize. There, there's rank, you know, if when I was in the military, somebody had four of these or two of these <laughs> and one of these, I saluted and so on. So there's rank involved. But also there's the, there's the power of information, there's the power of expertise, there's the power of linkage, and then there's your personal power. You always have these four sources of power regardless of how much rank you have. Then it comes down to courage and creating a context that is relatively safe to speak in. So this is another thing that you will know, nobody else uh, listening to this will, under, will know, but you will, everybody know, how safe is it in my organization to, um, to speak up about something that, um, that, that concerns me. Uh, an awful lot of the leadership development work that, that we do is, is to ironically help leadership teams realize that the more they hear, the better, the better they'll be able to exert leadership. Thanks, hope that helped. Eddie, it looks John, like- I'm, you saw I'm just one. keeping, yeah, an eye over here in the chat, the answer to your question about current uh, leadership situations. We've got a huge variety of situations. I'll just pick a couple of them here we to read everybody. Summarize there, yeah. uh, our company has 300 working from home, utilizing teams. Um, the lack of transparency and reaction by our organization has been disappointing. Over 300 positions were abolished in that case. Uh, there's one here I saw, our executive leadership has stated that they believe we will have a majority of employees working from home in the years to come. So you've got a, a breadth of situations, layoffs are happening. Uh, yeah. Some people are looking to the future, but it's gonna be different. Yeah, this is great. And you know, there's no uh, one answer, there's no one size fits all here. Uh, a lot comes down to what is the strategic intention of the organization? Is it short term? Is it long term? Uh, what do the owners, the shareholders, what, what, why, why are they doing what they're doing? What is the executive team's mandate? If their mandate is to uh, preserve or increase shareholder value, then they're going to start laying people off because you know when your when your numbers go down, then your people, then the numbers of people go down, and so on. If you're fortunate enough to be in an organization where the shareholders and the strategic intention is long range, you may have people hanging in there a little bit longer uh, to find out what's gonna happen. Um, I'm gonna, what I wanna do is go through this a little more and see if when I get to the corporate part of the, of the Adventus process, see if you can't see a way to bring some of this way of thinking into your organization. Um, I'm, my, my heart goes out to you. I, I, I do m and A's sometimes other consulting firms are brought into what I call changing the chart. I'm brought into change, changing the heart. Like how do, you get, how do you help people, how do you help human beings deal with the new reality? How do you, how do you help them let go um, and move on? Hopefully what I'm saying now will help in that regard. So Eddie, I'm gonna keep going here and we'll see if, we'll come back to any of them that, that, that don't work. Okay, let me see what we got here. What leadership stances okay so leadership is about getting right thinking about the future well what are the stances that leadership could take when you think about this uh this uh this particular culture and hang on a minute let me get my let me get my thing here um how do i get rid of this are you seeing this thing on my screen here okay let me all we see is your slide. slide okay great 
Well, there are two very different stances that are available at this point, and they have and they have two very different outcomes. Okay, one is uh, let's call it stance A, and stance A is the concept of the future. This word futurus is the Latin word for future, and it comes from the verb to be. So if you're going to take this stance toward the future, it's like budgeting. Here you are, you're standing here in the present. The way you budget is you look back and you look at what the, what the, uh, what the curves have been and then you, you predict, you plan and you hope and you, your, your success is predicting accurately. If you have a futurist attitude toward the future, you think that the future is going to be a lot like it is now only with some modification. And so you, you predict, you plan, and you hope. Everybody does this. Budgeting, you pretty much have to do that, but not just in budgeting. Quite often people do this, and then they hope. The only problem is it just rarely happens that way. So I've got a very radically different concept for how to, how to embrace the future, and it's another Latin word for the future. There's these two words for the future. What a missed opportunity it is to take that particular view of, view of the future. Um, Kurt Lewin, who was a, uh, a Polish applied behavioral scientist who actually created the field uh, that, that we now um, uh, practice uh, called change management. He said in the 1930s that there are these three phases in any change uh, process. First, there has to be an unfreeze, a pattern interrupt. Uh, sometimes we call that the burning platform. Very few uh, leadership teams wake up in the morning and say, oh, things are going so great, let's just change everything. It's almost always something happening uh, uh, that shocks the organization and break. We, we can't keep doing what we've been doing. It's a pattern interrupt. And that leads then to an opportunity to change or move things. You have to unfreeze. You can't just change something when it's frozen. You have to unfreeze, then move, and then you refreeze and you come back again. And this cycle just continues to repeat itself. So it all begins with an unfreeze or a pattern interrupt. Well, boy, what do we have now if it isn't a pattern interrupt? This unfreeze is like throwing all the cards up in the air. All these questions. Nobody knows what to do. Nobody knows what the future is going to be. This is the first time that I've, in my years of doing this work, I mean, People talk about grief. How do you grieve when you don't know what's dead? You know, how do you, how do you let go of something when you're not sure what you're supposed to let go of and what you're supposed to hold on to? So we are in a, in a global state of unfreeze. It's like uh, throwing all the cards up in the air. I was a magician for 12 years from back in my earlier days. You throw the cards up in the air and they have to come down. And the, the, the fabulous thing is that while the cards are coming down, they're up in the air. We had this expression, everything is up in the air or up for grabs. It's open to influence. So you can't keep doing what you've been doing. Everything is kind of loose. Fabulous, fabulous opportunity for leadership at all levels in the organization to begin working on, okay, now that it's loose, maybe we can change some things. That's what I want to show you before we're done, okay? So that leads me to stance B. Futurist was A, okay? Here's the future as Adventist. Think about adventure. What if the future isn't closed? What if you're not trying to guess what it's gonna be? What if you're actually able to shape it? What if you're having an adventure in life? It's just like going on, a, I'm an Eagle Scout or you know, canoe camping, been down this river many times, but you never know for sure. Is that rock still gonna be there? Is that tree gonna be there or not? You don't know for sure what's gonna be around the next bend. The future is like that. We know it, we're helping to shape what happens by what we're doing now. Here we are, and we look back at the past. Yeah, we have to look at that and say, okay, what, and now, what can we learn from what's happening right now and what we did? But then a very significant thing happens. With Adventists, you turn around. You turn around and leadership faces into the future, reflects on what's happening now, chooses some options and then acts. You just start doing stuff, ready, fire, aim. You start with your intention and you just start doing stuff. 
And then you say, oh, let's try this. Oh, no, let's try this. Okay. And then what's happening, you're adapting, innovating, and you discover. The future is something that you discover when you're practicing Adventist. You don't predict it. You don't try to guess what it is. You try to get in a relationship with it and discover what's happening with the future, almost like a partnership. This is Adventist. This is what I have to say to the corporate world, especially, but governments, uh, anybody, families, relationships, anybody that wants to use this as an opportunity. So this is the Adventist process, and it's going to be how to turn lockdown into learning and reset if there is a need to renewal. Two applications, the team, organization, large system, and the personal family. Let's start with the organizational context first, and then we'll go to what's, okay, we'll start with the organization. Where, all the cards are up in the air, okay. Well, where is reset probably not a good idea? What are some of the areas that are, that, that are currently being affected by this virus? Strategy. What's your strategy? How do you, how the heck do you know what's the strategy? What's the right strategy? You know that's gonna be affected. What about leadership and governance? What does it mean? How do, how do you lead? How do you lead an organization where nobody's there, where everybody's doing something else or nobody knows what anybody's doing or, or what they used to do isn't relevant anymore? What about governance? How, how do, where, where's authority lie in the organization coming in, okay? These are all things that have to be discovered. You can't predict this. You can't guess about these things. You have to just start trying stuff and figure out what works. Policies, procedures, you know, working from home, my goodness, every policy you have is, is gonna to have to be looked at again. Processes, how do we do stuff? How do we process claims? How do we make things? How do we get stuff? How do we get the widgets out the door? Structures, roles, staffing. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what the future is gonna be in this area? What about practices and pattern? Like, how do we have meetings? What are meetings gonna be like? What about the culture? Do our core values change? You know, do they stay the same? Well, how do we operationalize them? Is, 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 is our culture still valid? Do we have to change our culture? These are all areas where discovery is gonna to have to happen. Mindset, attitude, learning, capabilities and skills. What do we need to hire for now? Is there some new set of capabilities that we never thought of before? Like able to work from home suddenly becomes an asset. Who knows what this happens? And then finally, how do we interact individuals, levels, departments, and skills? These are all areas where you're gonna to have to experiment and discover and learn. This takes an Adventist attitude, not a Futurist attitude at all. You can't guess these and get it right, I promise you. So here's the process and what I'm calling renewal experiments. The idea of experiments I've been doing for years and years and years when I started learning this long time ago, People don't like to change, but they're willing to try some experiments. Well, let's try this and see what happens. Okay, let's try this. Okay. So I recommend that in your in, in your first three domains, I mean the first three, you, you pick the top three here. The, the three that you think, you know, we really should get on these pretty quickly. And you take those first three domains and you ask and you look and you say, what are three things in this domain? Like let's say policies. What are three things that we hope we can hold on to from before? What are three things that, you know, we need to let go. This would be a great time to stop doing that because it just isn't working. And what are three things that we want to continue or start doing that we have discovered already during the lockdown or during this process? All right. Fabulous questions. Who should be doing this? The leadership team should be doing this. And then I'll show you what happens next. Then they work it out through the organization. Here's an Adventist process. Gather your senior leadership team, plus what I call a diagonal slice of the organization. People that represent various uh, areas and levels in the organization so that anybody looking at that group could say, yeah, there's somebody on there that kind of understands my world. Get that group together virtually or you know, if you have to and pick those first three domains together. So it's not just, the executives deciding what the top three are, let the organization contribute, participate in figuring out what are the three that we think will make the biggest difference if we can, if we can do some discovery in those areas. And then create another diagonal slice team for each of those three. 
that represent cross functions and levels. Use the Adventus process that I'm laying out here and then selected uh, representatives coordinate and the senior leadership team decides. And then pick the next three, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. So this becomes an ongoing process of learning and discovery based on what you're what, on, on what's been happening now. Hey, okay. John. Yeah, please. I'm sorry to jump in there. I did have a question come through to me that is uh, specific to this moment of your presentation. It says, can you further define a domain in the Adventist process? Okay, let's go back here. Um, these would be what these, this is in this context, what, by, what I mean by a domain would be one of these 10 things. Like for instance, let's take um, capabilities and skills would be a, it would be a domain. Um, what is it, what are we gonna need down the road? Who knows, okay? So we can guess, you can guess if you want, but why not, why not uh, use this process where you say, what are three things we wanna hold on to in the area of hiring and the kind of people we want? What are three things we should probably stop and what do we wanna continue or start to do in this process? Take these three questions and apply them to your top three or what I call your first three domains that need to be affected. I think whoever asked the question needs to realize that all 10 of these things, I don't care how big your organization is, I don't care what, your, what industry you're in, I don't care what your products are, I don't care anything about any of that stuff. I don't care what country you're in. I'm in Central and Eastern Europe and all, of, all the countries around me, everybody's going through that. Nobody gets to avoid being impacted in each of these 10 areas by this pandemic that's shaking the earth, okay? So what are you gonna do? This is my suggestion. Do the, pick the first, pick your first three, apply these three questions and then do this process here. Now, can people get uh, slides from this? Are they gonna be able to get these slides, Eddie? Okay. They'll be able to get them uh, in the YouTube live live link on the Pragmatic cool. Institute YouTube page. They can get the these whole six steps. Great. These are the six steps that I recommend that you, that your company does. And, you know, if you need outside help, I'm sure you have people that are OD consultants and others that can help you do that. Now let's go from the corporate domain to the personal domain. Okay. So now we're looking at uh, what, what happens and what could happen uh, at home rather than, rather than at work. Um, what are your hopes and fears? I recommend that you sit with these questions that I'm gonna lay out for you here. If you're in a relationship, do it with your partner. If you have a family, by the way, the, this, this part of it, the personal part has been translated into four languages. Uh, it's, it's, it's currently uh, being, I'm, I'm getting emails from people from like five, six, seven, eight, 10, 11, 12 countries now it's been copied, it's been translated, and people are just using it. It's, it's, it's an open source thing that I put out uh, when this whole thing started about two months ago. A uh, whole bunch of my colleagues from around the world, we said, what can we do? And we said, we know how to learn from experience. That's what we do. So let's help people do it. So these are, these are questions that we recommend you use. And I'm getting feedback that families are doing this. Even kids eight, nine, 10 years old can, can answer these kind of questions. Okay, where are you in this? in the lockdown pandemic process. Are you out on the street? Are you still at home? What are your hopes and fears for the future? And then listen to each other, just listen. What gifts have you discovered during this process? Here I am, I'm at home in my apartment. I haven't left this apartment for 10 weeks. I, I go for a walk when the sun is out, wear my mask, go out, you know, uh, walk, the, walk in, the, in the sunshine here in, in, in Warsawa. Uh, my older son is here. He does a shopping for us, he says, dad, you don't go near the front door. I got this. So he gets all of our groceries. And I've been here. So a gift that I've discovered is I can do this. I can, I, I'm not going crazy here. You know, um, I don't understand it, but I'm happy to discover. I wouldn't want to be in prison. That's another story. Uh, but I, I've, dis I've discovered that I can actually do this, right? I also like to cook. I'm discovering some things I didn't know about that. And then have people talk about What's your number one thought or feeling about what has been happening? You know, different from these other things. What, what, what's the general feeling? Are you hopeful? Are you anxious? You know, what, what's, what's happening inside of you? That's experiment number one. Great conversation to have. 
have a series of meetings in the family about this. Here's number two, shifting where you put your attention. So these are, these are uh, seven areas that I came up with years ago for, and if, if you don't like those seven, here's space for another one. Like, how is your, what, where are you putting your attention prior to the, this COVID-19 thing? How much attention were you putting into work, into your financial well-being, into your family, into the community and larger world, into your own personal development, into your circle of friends, your health and well-being, or something else? And here's how I like to do this. I like to, I like to draw like this, if, if, you, if you can print these out. Like, put, you know, how much energy and attention are you currently putting in these areas? So this is mine from actually when this whole thing started about seven or eight weeks ago, but this was up until now, that's, that's my default, okay? And then yours, of course, will be different. And then where would you like to shift that energy? What are you learning in this lockdown about what's really important to you? And how, if you, if you had a choice, which you do, and since all the cards are up in the air and you have a chance to influence things as they come down, change a few things, where would you shift your attention? And this is what I did. And then I suggested you pick three of these where you think you can make a difference. So I want to reduce the amount of energy I'm putting into my work. Even at my age, I, my work is so much fun, I don't even think about it. But I, I want to give myself more of a break from time to time. I'm learning here in this COVID-19 lockdown. Yeah, I need a break sometimes. Just do nothing, read a book, something like that. I want to spend some time with friends. I can't wait to go to the restaurants, or go to the movies, go to the park, do something like that. And then I want to reach out more to the community in the larger world. And this Adventist process, this Adventist initiative that we put out to the, to the world for people to use at home is an example of my commitment to, to make more of an impact, if I possibly can, positive impact in the community in the larger world. So, and this is an experiment or conversation number three. What is one simple but profound act that you will commit to be or do in response to this lockdown as soon as possible? Just one thing that you're taking out of this that you've already learned, something you've already discovered, something that you have already, in a sense, inside at least, made a choice to uh, put, into, put into action in your life in some way, in a, in, in a much more concrete way. Now, uh, this is the group that helped put this together. You can see where they're from, New York, Warsaw, Krakow, Berlin, Paris, San Francisco, Toronto. This is the group that, uh, that, that, that helped me create this uh, Adventist process. I'd like to stop here. And um, I think, Eddie, uh, go into a kind of a Q&A uh, about any of this, either at the personal level or at the corporate level, and uh, take some time now to respond to, uh, respond to some of the questions. Sure thing. Uh, audience, if you have questions you'd like to submit, stick them in the chat. You can send those either to the whole group or to me personally. I did have a couple come through as you were talking about this very chart. The question was, can the personal renewal experiment, the chart with the circles, uh, be applied to an organization? Do you have any examples and how is it different than when you're applying it to yourself personally or to a family? Absolutely. This is where this came from. Uh, originally, as an organizational change consultant back in the long time ago, uh, and, and and of course, it's instead of coming up with one and and giving it to an organization, I would sit down again with a diagonal slice group, you know, not just the executive group, but I would say I want to meet with the executive group, and I'd like you to augment who's in the room by people that represent all the levels and functions, and I and I would ask the group. What are seven areas, significant areas, that if you were to step back and say, where are we currently putting our effort, our attention, and our energy? And it's really interesting to see what happens when lower level people or people in different departments will do this. And then you, and then you get everybody in the room and you create one, okay, now, where, where, where do we wanna shift our energy? So it might, be, it might be the sales process, it might be processing claims, it might be you know, whatever the, whatever the areas are. And this is a real simple, I'm a simple guy. And I just wanna focus people's attention in a simple process that enables them to make simple changes that make a big difference. So this is what I would suggest is you take these seven circles, blank circles, sit down with, uh, with, with whoever you think 
would be willing to listen to you and uh, propose this process of getting together a diagonal slice group to say, what are our areas? I think that with the domains is actually, this is the one if I was gonna start with an organization, uh, I, would, I, would, I would go into somebody and say, look, I saw this guy, we did this webinar the other day and he said, you know, stuff's going crazy in these areas and we have a chance now to make some changes. Uh, can we start a process to do that? That's what I have to say about that, Eddie. Okay. Uh, Aaron just sent this one. Do you have any tips for balancing where you put your attention if, for instance, you only reduced work a bit, but want to add attention to several other spheres? Uh, I guess, you know, your spheres can only be so big. What if you want everything to go up? Or <laughs> That's a great question. What's his name? Who is it? What's his name? This was this was Aaron. E Aaron, oh, Aaron. No, Aaron. Maybe maybe male or female. Aaron, that is that is that is that is a great question. Um, in our in our leadership intensive that we do uh, for for individual uh, leaders, and we ask them to fill this in. Quite often, they'll the work one. They'll just fill. You know, they'll just draw outside the circle. And the interesting thing I want you to get is this is not mathematical. This is not a left brain thing. This is a right brain thing. It doesn't have to add up to 100%. You know this because uh, time, when you're in a relationship, time is elastic. Energy is elastic. You know when you're working on a project that you love, you, you'll work for hours and hours and hours, never get tired. And when you're doing something that's you know not so much fun, you get exhausted fairly quickly. So I would not... I would urge you to take a more uh, right brain approach to this. What if they were all filled in? See, this is not about uh, too much energy or it's not about time. It's not about time. It's about attention. And as you could have them all filled in fully as long as you had a life which allowed you to move smoothly in and around all of these, then you have no problem. But so the problem is not how much, but where you, where you get fixated. So if you, if you fixate on work to the exclusion of some of these others, then it's a good idea to, if you have to cut down on work and imagine I'm gonna take some of that ink and move it over here to these others, then that will help you. But it isn't about that. It's just about intention. It's about attention and intention. Where do I put my attention and where would I like, what's my intention? And just begin to work that way. Good luck, so Aaron. So a follow up to that one, John. Uh, what is the best approach then? Is it to focus on one circle per day or can you even have more than one circle in top of mind at once? <laughs> These are tough questions. We need to sit down over a cup of tea or hey, something. Or our, or our audience is a smart beer, bunch. Wine, this, this, stuff, these aren't softball you, questions. You need John. to tell me a little bit more about yourself. I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, uh, or I don't, I mean, are you capable of, of doing, you know, I mean, I, I have these plates I'm spinning, you know, here at this point in my life, I probably shouldn't have so many plates spinning, but I'm running up and down spinning a bunch of plates. So if I can do it, I know you can do it. The question is, do you want to do it? What do you really want to focus on in your life? And then just do it and figure out how, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's about what goes in your calendar, that's great. Let your calendar reflect your priorities and what you really, what you really want and what you need. I think if you were to ask your body, your mind, and your spirit, maybe in that order, what if your body were to, were, what if your body were to answer that question? What would your body choose for priorities in your life? What, what would your, let's say it's your mind. You think it's your mind choosing, but so what is your mind telling you? And what about spirit? What about that energy center in you that, that sort of where lives down in there somewhere, the best of who you are? If it was whispering in your ear, what would, it, what would it suggest that you do or not do or start doing? Try that. Do you have time for one more at this point, John? Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to wrap this up when we're done with the questions. So Lalita, you guys, Eddie, tell me, tell me what, you, what you want me good. to do. Here's a, here's a good one that Kate asks. Kate says, how do you manage the execution of the change that the diagonal teams determine need to be made? How do you organize the work to shift the process. Great. Yeah, that's where, that's where the action happens. I know I'm, I'm laying it out here like it's a simple process, but uh, this work is called organization development or uh, you know, 
plan change. I've been doing this for many, many years. Um, what you do is, and it's it's implied in here, but let's say let's say that uh, procedures, pro processes, and or policies and procedures turns out to be an area. You know what we're we really need to work on those. That's that's going to be one of our top three. All right. You create a cross-functional team, maybe a dozen people, depending on how big your organization is, and you get that group together and you put them in a room or you know in a room somehow, and they and they ask themselves, what are some things we're currently doing that we think is a good idea to hold on to? What are some things that it's like, mm -mm, no, uh, it, it, it didn't work then, it's not working now, it isn't gonna work in the future. Let, what, let's just put that in a, in a, over in a file folder called probably not. And then what's the third area? What are some things that we, that we have learned or that we need to learn in this particular area? And then have that group, of course, this all has to be sanctioned by the decision makers. They need to be um, not, this is not something you do against leadership, but this is something that leadership sponsors. And the group at the top is eager for you to come up with your, with your action recommendations. And then depending on your decision-making culture, that group does some creative thinking, comes up with recommendations. Here are things we think we should uh, continue to do, things we should stop doing, <clears throat> things we need to learn or develop. Take that list to the executive team and then run it through your business as usual. You know how to make stuff happen once you've made a decision. That's great. And do that for those three. And then... Take the next three. And this way, like I like to tell people, you got two jobs in this organization. One is your regular job where you work in the organization, but you, from time to time, you're gonna be asked to step away and work on the organization, not just in it, but on it. This is a process where people step back, get up in the, in the balcony, look at the game, how we're playing the game, and then come down in small teams and take on things to make recommendations for change. <coughs> A little bit of a little bit of grapefruit juice here. One more, you got time? Absolutely. Oh, they're going to keep coming. These folks will just uh, ring you dry, John. I think all, right. all the advice you can give. Here's an interesting one from Elisa. Any tips on how to achieve consensus on implementing rapid changes? How do you manage conflicts or disagreements or non-compliance to these changes? <laughs> <laughs> what have I got? Not messing around, these folks, John. I got three minutes for this, Lalita. We need we need some workshops here. We need yeah. some workshops. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, let me work backwards. <clears throat> Any kind of change initiative needs to be sponsored from the top. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but it works better when people at the top are saying, "Let's do this." And here's, we're going to put support behind this process. Um, in, in, in my leadership program years ago, um, this woman at 12, 16 people in a circle for four days, very deep dive into who you are as a leader, who is the person inside the position. And we're going around the first day, uh, who are you, why are you here, and so on. And this woman said, hello, my name is so-and-so, and I'm just a secretary. And I went, eh. and she said, what? And I said, let's try that again. She said, uh, hello, my name is so-and-so and I'm just a secretary. And then half the group went, eh. and she said, what? And I said, come on, what do you mean just a secretary? What does that mean? She said, well, I don't really have any, any rank or power in this organization. Well, this, lady went, this woman went home back to Salt Lake City, actually, this huge energy company, I mean, like, 10,000 people. And about a month later, I get this phone call from the CEO. And he says, uh, I, you, you've been recommended uh, to me, John, could you come and help us do this huge change project inside the organization? And I said, well, let's keep talking. Uh, how did you hear about me? And he, he mentions this person's name. And I said, oh, and he said, she's my secretary. <laughs> She, and, and so I started this project, took some of my colleagues there, and we did this work for several months. And one day he and I were in a meeting. This is a CEO now, this huge, huge uh, multi-state corporation. And he says, oh my God, John, I gotta go, I gotta go. I said, oh, okay. He said, I got a meeting uh, with so-and-so. She's, she's called a meeting. And I said, now what, let me see if I understand this right. You're the CEO and you're jumping up and you have to go to a meeting that your secretary has called. 
for this process? And he said, absolutely. I wouldn't miss it for anything. And I said, tell me why. He said, because everything good that's happened in this organization in the last three months has happened because of a meeting that so-and-so called. He said, I wouldn't miss it for the world. So, so who is this person's name? Can you say her first name? Was it was a woman, Eileen? No, who is it? That was Elisa. Lisa. So Lisa, I don't care where you are in the organization. If you've got the courage and you're willing to willing to, you know, push it, you can get things done. Now, what is it that you need to push? A process. The answer is always a process. It's 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 never a theory or it's never an answer. The answer has to be discovered by the people who are facing the problem. This is called action research. Google action research if you want. Uh, this, this is the principle that is, is a, it's, it's my secret of success all these years. Engage the people who are experiencing the problem in identifying and figuring out the solutions to the problem. It's not, it's not it doesn't take a, a rocket science to figure that out. I don't know why the big four haven't, haven't discovered that. That's my advice. Uh, call me, I don't know, email me, I don't know, find me on LinkedIn or something and I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a couple things if you need it. That is a good question as we're approaching the end of our time. Uh, John, if folks have further questions and we didn't get to them today, where can they get a hold of you? How many people are on this call? 50? Two billion. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I'm gonna my my assistant Magda is gonna say, what did you <laughs> what did you tell me? <laughs> well, I would say, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to. Uh, do something at john at sharercenter.com. Yeah. John at sharercenter. It's S C H E R E R. Yeah. Let me, oh, here, let's do this. Let me do this. Let me go, let me go here at the end. I've got a, I think I've got a thing here. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Thank you so much, John. There, I'm sure that there were further questions that just didn't get asked today, so you can expect some input from there. But uh, this has been enlightening for me, and I'm sure for the audience as well. Thank you so much for your time on that. Um, Thanks for just the to, It's been a blast. Uh, to wrap up then, a reminder and a thank you to our, our partner today, the Product Development Days. Don't forget to check out their event, October 27th to the 29th of which Pragmatic Institute is a platinum partner. But a huge thank you to our guest today and speaker, Dr. John Scherer. This has been incredible. Um, you can join us again Tuesday, June 19th for the next of our product chat series. That's at 1 p.m. Eastern time on June 9th. Did I say 19th? June 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Our guest then will be Bonnie Smith and Rob Jensen, senior consultants at Ignite Advisory Group. They'll be discussing managing customer advisory boards during the pandemic crisis. That'll be an interesting one. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, I'll be there. And uh, if you if you just miss that or you you miss uh, Pragmatic Institute, you can always join us every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time for our office hours with a pragmatic instructor. That's an ask me anything format. So bring your hardest questions to them. They love it. And uh, in the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week. And thanks, John. As they say here in Eastern Europe, stay negative. Stay negative. Stay negative. <laughs> All right. Stay Goodbye. Great. All. Stay negative. <clears throat>